You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q U I K S T R I K E One. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for Twifo. This week in Futures Options, a program where the name says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is from a Futures Options trading and trending and analysis and unusual activity and volatility and skew and all those fun perspectives. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Hope you guys are liking the new TWIFO time. Been doing it for a few weeks now here, close to a month. Uh, Friday, excuse me, used to be Fridays at 1.30 p.m. Central, and I moved it up a day, Thursday 1.30 p.m. Central. It means you get the, the live stream, obviously, early. You also get the podcast out earlier, which I think a lot of you guys uh, like out there. So join us Thursdays, 1.30 p.m. Central. If you can, we'd love to see you in there. And uh, joining me on the old program today, my usual cohort, my stalwart partner through the world of futures options, Mr. Nick Howard from Bantix. 
taking a much needed, much earned vacation this week. He's, uh, I'm not sure where he is. I think he's out back east doing something fun, I hope. Uh, so joining me, he's been in the CME hot seat before. We thought that was a little uncomfortable for him. It's a very uncomfortable cheer. It's got the spikes and things kind of like the Iron Throne. So I thought we'd bump him up to a full uh, guest co-host seat for this episode. Our old friend, Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management. He of silver collar infamy. Mr. Uncle Mike, welcome back to Twifo, sir. It has been quite some time. Always excited to be here. Love the t- This is probably my favorite show title on the entire network this week in Futures Options. How about that? You know, it just says it all, right? Uh, you can't, you can't, you can't look askance at it, sir, because it, it's, it's very, it summarizes, if nothing else. You know what you're getting when you see that title. Absolutely. We looked into licensing of this week in baseball, and uh, it was it was just too much. <laughs> Nick really wanted it, but uh, I think it was beyond the scope, the budget of this program for uh, for just every use. But it would have been cool. Uh, all right, and also joining us uh, from the land of Footsie Russell, literally this time because they're out there in Seattle at the HQ. First off, we are joined by my other stalwart compatriot here on the program, Mr. Sean Smith, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there at FTSE Russell. And Sean, you brought yourself a guest today. You brought our old friend Ron Bundy, the CEO of Benchmarks at North, excuse me, Benchmarks for North America at FTSE Russell. Gentlemen, welcome back to TWIFO. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, Mark. It's good to be back for another, another show. Looking forward to it. So what brings you out to Seattle these days? What's going on in the, in the HQ out there? So we've got uh, offices globally. Seattle's one of our big offices that we have uh, uh, clearly from our um, from the Russell heritage. So we are here seeing some clients, uh, have some um, you know some some big brainstorming sessions on derivatives and in uh, our derivatives business that Sean's leading. Uh, so it's been a good it's been a good few days so far. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Let's dive right into it since we got you guys on. Let's let's dive right into the the deep pool. That is equities and all things equities these days. It's been an interesting, tumultuous period uh, for equities. You know, Sean, you and I have talked a number of times, uh, you know, about a lot of different things going on in the equity landscape. Uh, you guys are obviously uh, look a lot at Russell because that's your baby. And the Russell uh, 2000 has kind of been blowing the doors off just about everything else out there in terms of net raw performance. Uh, in terms of the last you know, few weeks, it's been kind of interesting. It's been kind of a tumultuous period in the markets. We saw a lot of earnings volatility being reflected in the markets and some sell-offs. And then, of course, uh, in the last week or so, we've seen really just uh, markets back in bullish territory post some good numbers coming out of big names like Apple and Tesla and a few others really helping to just bolster the markets going forward. Today, of course, as we're recording this a little bit past 1.30 p.m. Central here, Excuse me. We're seeing the markets kind of settling into a bit of a mixed period. S&P almost literally unched uh, the tech heavy Nasdaq up ever so slightly. Uh, we're seeing the Dow pretty much unched on the day. And we're seeing the Russell 2000 kind of leading the charge up about oh, about half a percent or so in that range. So kind of what we've been seeing for a while now. Russell kind of outperforming uh, to the upside. Of the rest of the indices is kind of uh, mixed or, or doing their own thing. It's been an interesting time frame. You know, for you guys, you know, Ron and Sean, you guys spend your days all day with the indexes. Uh, has this been kind of an interesting period talking to clients, I would think? Because this last couple of months, you know, more than any other period in recent that I can remember in recent market history, we've seen each of the indices kind of, as I refer to it, kind of playing to its own base, kind of, you know, doing its own thing. I wouldn't say independent of the other indices, but kind of playing, moving to the beat of its own drummer. Has that been something you guys have been talking about a lot over there in index land? Is that something that your your clients are picking up on as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mark, this is Ron. So what we're seeing is, you know, on the Russell 2000, for example, it is very, it is a different index than the large cap indexes that are in the market. Um, the Russell 2000 is a great reflection of the U.S. economy. Uh, the revenues associated with those 2,000 small company stocks are much more domestic in nature versus some of the re- really larger multinational companies you see in the Russell 1,000 large cap index, you know, for example. And so with the strength of the U.S. economy and the uh, tax policy, the current administration really helping those smaller players in a significant way, you know, we're, we're still seeing a lot of, 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 of movement and a lot of, you know, good momentum in, the, in those Russell 2000 small company stocks. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been fascinating uh, to watch. Kind of a, 
and it's interesting stuff. You guys, uh, I mentioned before, by the way, I forgot to mention top of the show. You can follow along. We'll get into all the options activity in, uh, in a couple of seconds. And, of course, you can follow along. Generate your own reports over there, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. You can see all the reports uh, we're going to look at here for all the products in a couple of seconds. I mentioned before you guys have a lot of interesting data coming out of, uh, of FTSE Russell. And coming into the show, you guys put out some interesting stuff. Uh, you mentioned the Russell 2000 is also, of course, the Russell 1000, which is the, really the big, larger cap names. And some of your, your research team looking at the numbers coming out for July, I thought was kind of interesting. They were kind of breaking down what performed, how everything performed over the month of July. And they have, uh, you know, uh, the FTSE Europe, UK, I, I, without UK out there, doing about 4.1% to the upside, kind of leading the charge. Then the Russell 1000 up there with about 3.5% upside. This, again, for the month of July. Uh, FTSE Emerging Market Index, 2.7% to the upside. Uh, then gold off about 2.3% for the month. Uh, the Chinese c- currency versus the dollar there off nearly 3%. Copper taken on the chin off about 5%. Oil off 6% for the month, 6.3%. And then the FANG stocks bringing up the bottom there uh, down nearly 7%. It shows you just how important those kind of uh, those big names, you know, the Facebook, the Apples, the, all the other stuff, Amazon, uh, really are to the market these days. In fact, your 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 research team also did went the extra mile and they pulled out the Fang stocks out of the Russell 1000. They looked at them separately, and if you look at the Russell 1000, kind of sans Fang stocks, it's up about five percent for the year. You know, so it's doing well, but it's it's you know the Fang stocks themselves are up about close to 30 at least they were until the sell-off began about a few sessions ago uh so it's been just shows how important these uh these you know these big names are for index performance going on over here Mark, mike you know you and i have talked before on the show i know you do a lot of uh, s p and uh that's kind of where you do a lot of your equity playing has uh have since you've been on the show we talked a lot of russell with you since you've been on the show the last few times has this something that you're looking at? And also, you deal with a lot of uh, you know clients over there. Are a lot of clients coming to you, uh, starting to look at you know maybe other indices uh, to play with for their equity exposure. What's interesting about the Russell is that, from what I'm hearing, or from what a lot of my clients have the interest in, is that a lot of the companies that are in the Russell don't have quite as much multinational exposure. And so if you're concerned with the trade war, the tariffs and that type of thing, uh, the Russell may be a place to actually park some capital for the time being if you still want to have upside in the market, but you're a little bit concerned about the trade wars. Now, of course, there's another set of risks that exist with the different size of stocks that are going on. But I think one of the things that intrigues myself and a lot of other clients or a lot of people that I talk to about uh, actually looking at the Russell at this point in time is not only just the different class or different level of stock, uh, the fact that it has a, a much l- typically a uh, much lesser amount of multinational exposure. Yeah, that's kind of what uh, we've been saying that for a while. I know Ron and Sean, when you guys are out there beating the drum for all things uh, Russell, that's probably a, a refrain you hear a lot from the clients these days. Like, hey, maybe we, we kind of like that this is a little bit more insulated from these macro tremors out there. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah, that is what we're hearing, and, and I think we're. I think that's being reflected, you know, in the market. And the other thing, just to add, you know, Mike's comments that you see in the Russell 2000 stocks, so small company stocks, is because most, because of a larger portion of their revenues are domestic, they they could potentially benefit even more than the bigger companies with these tax cuts that have come into play. So the the the, the really profitable small company stocks who have more exposure to the U.S market and U.S. revenues, you know, could really benefit not only from the macro trends on the tariffs and things like like that, not impacting them as much, but on the tax side, gives them more money to invest and grow potentially as well. So there's there's some interesting dynamics happening um, in that in that uh, in that segment in the Russell 2000. And and the the market speaks for itself. This is Sean. Um, The just the performance of the Russell 2000 versus large caps is, you know, clear. It's a up 10% versus five and change in the large cap. Yeah. Well, let's look at some of that performance. So we're looking here right now. Again, you guys can follow along, cmegroup.com slash twifo coming into showtime. Uh, the S&P, or excuse me, the S&P, the Russell 2000 uh, was up about 20 net handles uh, on the week coming into here. So right, right about flirting with that 1700 level, 16, uh, you know, 95 or so here. And uh, we're seeing as all this upside continuing out there. We're seeing vol 
coming off commensurately. We're seeing vol come off across the board in all the major indices. So we're seeing in the NASDAQ, we're seeing in the S&P. Clearly, a lot of people like to look at the levels of S&P vol versus Russell. And right now we're seeing uh, the VIX hovering right about a 1075 or so, VIX cash at least. Uh, Russell vol, a.k.a. our old friend RVX, a little bit short, shy of three handles north of that, about, about 1365 or so. So right about 290. So that spread hovering a little bit shy of three bucks. So it's still fairly wide. Uh, so that means we're seeing S&P vol coming off at a greater clip. Then we're seeing it coming off out there in Russell land, so that spread's widening. We've seen it get down to as low as about you know 1.4, 1.5 or so. So it's getting uh, quite wide. We know when that when that spread kind of widens out, uh, we see a lot of people out there looking to perhaps dip their toes in one leg uh, or the other. Let's see what legs we're actually lighting it up out here uh, this week. You know, it's been kind of interesting. We were talking last show. Uh, it's kind of surprisingly across the board in all the indices, Russell, S and P, and others. We saw a lot of extreme far out of the money put trading going on last week let's see if we're seeing that lighting up again this week here in the old russell uh, 2000 you know if you're talking equities you usually are looking at where the lion's share of the action is is going to be in the weeklies and the options perspective anyway and we're seeing that again uh, this week looks like near term near out of the money puts uh, so week two about 20 odd hand all the money puts are kind of number one with the bullet out here again this week oh by the way fairly strong up about four percent here uh, for the E-mini Russell 2000 options out here. Looking here for any interesting aberrant paper we're seeing going up. Uh, some far, far out of the money puts, 1375 So about 300 odd handles going up out there in, what are those? Those are June, uh, the June contract. So they're not pretty small, but still interesting enough. And also seeing on the upside, 19 quarter going up on the upside in Dece of 2018. So we've got a nice little diverse range out there when we're looking at uh, at what's lighting it up out there from a footsie excuse me e-mini uh, russell 2000 options perspective sean you're out there kind of leading the charge for all things uh, footsie russell derivatives out there uh, what are you hearing from people out there who are slinging the options what are they up to what are they looking to do why are they come with the product and then also if you got any maybe hints any interesting things you guys are working on in the in the derivatives land. Hint, RVX. I'm just going to put it out there for you. Uh, if you want to drop it to us now on the show, feel free. Well, the um, uh, the options markets, you know, is is your wheelhouse there, uh, Mark. Um, the comments we're hearing is, uh, you know, through our partners at CME and CBOE, uh, who do a phenomenal job uh, uh, with distribution and educating the market and, and selling their products. Um, of which we are, are just tremendous partners of them with. Um, the liquidity has just been phenomenal in, in uh, CBOE's products and also CME's futures. Uh, open interest is, is still just hovering around 600,000 contracts. Um, the, the volumes at uh, CME and their options products ha are actually growing as well. Um, CBOE's are, are, are doing well. There's good tight markets there. Really, really exciting just to see the, the kind of hockey stick volume growth story that we're seeing since, you know, it's been just over a year that the business has transitioned to back to CME. And we're just really excited to see the growth of uh, all sectors trading the product from institutional to, to retail. So it's just been a, a great story. And Ron, I know I spent a lot, you spent a lot of your days over there in the indices uh, wing talking about uh, the big trend still of, you know, active versus passive, how that's kind of playing out as well as I know in your neck of the woods, smart beta is just the, the term du jour. Uh, so you got anything cooking on those fronts, anything interesting working over there that might interest our audience? Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot going on there. Um, and you're right there. We, we can see, continue to see a shift of interest in, uh, you know, from active strategies to more passive strategies but Mark, to your point, the, the smart beta category for you know is, is kind of the, the smart beta is the buzzword, and you know, a lot of those you know new uh, products that you're seeing out there really are you know have have their roots in active management. So we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in in factor, multi-factor, um, you know, investing like you know momentum, size, quality, you know, things like that. Um, and you'll you know over time, I think you'll start to see those types of products expand from a mutual fund or an ETF into, you know, futures and options and give you know, investors, you know, a lot of other tools, you know, to manage their exposures. And at the end of the day, that's what, that's what we're all doing, right? Is we're, we're managing our exposures to different segments of the market. And we continue to look for new ways to do that, you know, within a, within a futures and options 
you know, uh, platform as well. We'll we handle the index side of it, and then we let our, you know, our our our, our friends CBOE and CME, you know, handle the, uh, the the derivative side of it. All right. Speaking of new products, we have to keep rolling with complexes. We'll get back to equities in a little bit when we have a bunch of our listeners chiming in with the questions. If you guys want to chime in on crude and all the other fun stuff we're going to talk about here, feel free. Uh, Ron and Sean there as well. You know, I know it's not in the index realm, but it's uh, it's a lot of stuff lighting up our our audiences' tapes. We know, and a lot of my people have been talking about crude yet again. It's kind of on the radar for everyone. It was kind of hovering, had a bit of a some rough periods, had a bit of a sell off yesterday. On Wednesday, kind of hovering right around seven week lows, right around coming into showtime is at the 67 handle, so off about a point and a half on the week, so a little over 2%, about 2.4% net on the week. Vol, kind of as usual out there in WTI, again, bit of a mixed bag, front portion of the curve, a little bit bit up, that's mostly gamma again, and then you get a little bit farther out into the meteor portions of the curve out there, you know, past, uh, into November and beyond, and uh, it seems like vol actually getting a little bit robust. So maybe people pricing a little bit more longer term volatility uh, or coming off a little bit longer term volatility and pricing up a little bit more in the near term, which is kind of interesting out here. Looking at uh, at the week, oh, open interest up about close to 3%, about 2.7%. Uh, so kind of pretty much in line with what we've been seeing out there. And activity is funny. We don't see this very often. Exactly half, 50.0% of all this week's paper going up in that front month SEP contract. So again, it kind of shows how how front month heavy WTI typically is. Not so much in the weeklies. We talk about that a lot here on the show. For whatever reason, uh, the weeklies don't uh, light a fire under people in the energy in the energy complex. And what was lighting it up was pretty much they were at the money. Now in the money puts, they were the uh, SEP 68 puts kind of dominating the tape here with about 23,500 of those lighting it up. Uh, the lion's share coming actually on Tuesday, 8,500, 6,000 yesterday, about 4,600 on the tape today. A net about 3,000 or close to it opening, so slightly opening, but as you would expect, it's kind of an at-the-money put strike, so a lot of back-and-forth trading on that strike, opening and closing. Uh, we're also seeing kind of uh, hot on its heels, 267 puts, so exactly kind of at-the-money puts, doing about 20,000 contracts so far this week. And remember, recording this kind of halfway through the session on Thursday here. Uh, the lion's share also coming on Tuesday, about almost 8,000 going up then, and about 4,800 going up Wednesday, 3,500 on the tape today. Net actually closing a little bit there, about 4,000 and change, which is kind of interesting. So again, a lot of back and forth positioning on both of these kind of at the money strikes. Not all puts though, listeners, the, the bulls have some love too. Uh, the 70 calls out here doing about 17,000 contracts again Wednesday. Leading the charge here on the call side, about 7,500, 4,500 hitting the tape today, about net close to 3,000 uh, opening up on uh, the upside. And let's jump around here a little bit as well. We've got 71 calls, also interesting. It's kind of a near at the money call and put strip is kind of what we're seeing there in the front month. We're going to jump around a little bit to see if we can see any other funky strikes out here. The 80 calls lighting it up in November to the tune of about 2,000 and chain 60 puts. So some farther out downside in Dece doing about 4,000 contracts so far this week. 45 puts, very pessimistic indeed. The March 4, 2019, 45 puts, doing about 1,000 and change out here. And then a little bit longer term, we've got actually 60 calls in D sub 2020, lighting it up to the tune of 3,000 contracts. Interesting, you don't see a lot of in-the-money calls. It looks like that was, looks like a 60, 70 vertical went up on Wednesday, 2,000 times. I'll have to, when I drag Nick back on, I'll have to have him dig into the blocks for me to take a look at that one. It's like 2,000, up 2,000 times on Wednesday and 1,000 times today by itself. That's the vertical 2,000 times on Wednesday, and then today just 1,000 of the 60 calls. So maybe they're rolling a little bit down there as well, which wouldn't be that surprising. Uh, but still, into an in-the-money strike, that's uh, that's interesting interesting choice there. Mike, I know you watch a lot of energy. You look at a lot of diverse different products. You look at WTI, you also look at XLE and a bunch of other things. What's uh, what's catching your eye out there from a crude oil and just an energy perspective these days? Well, I'm looking at the energy. We're kind of in a unique time right now in that uh, we have the I guess it's not so super unique. The neatness of the craziness in the Middle East, I guess you could probably say that at pretty much any point in the last 50 years and be accurate. But uh, overall, over the last few years, ever since we started uh, getting all the extra oil uh, from North Dakota that we had not had in years past, uh, oil is kind of in a different world these days because – uh, there's, it's not just a Texas thing. It's not just a Middle East thing. It's, uh, we, we have another player that's involved in it. And, uh, uh with that, we, we, 
in looking at crude over the course of the last year, just seeing the lows around on the 45, but I'm still a bull on it and not necessarily because of the fact that, um, well, obviously not because of the fact that we have the extra player in with North Dakota, but I'm a bull on it from the fact that uh, I believe we're going to have more demand for oil uh, because we're going to have more need for it because I, I be- personally believe we are in an expanding economy. And when it, uh, typically uh, you're going to need more oil uh, for that reason and with increased demand, uh, it's going to be higher prices. Now, of course, the bear case for oil is if you look at where the high were in uh, the 2012-2013 era, uh, we're still down quite a bit from there, and we haven't come back to that in a while. But uh, I really believe that uh, this is going to be, uh, as the markets go up, and uh, for those of you that typically don't listen to or that uh, don't listen to our other show, I'm kind of bullish on the markets typically. Uh, Longo has some interesting names that he calls me because of my bullishness on the market. But I believe that as the market expands, I believe that oil is going to come up with it. And uh, we're positioning ourselves in such a way with energy stocks. Yeah, we're looking at some interesting, some data coming out of this week. Kind of, uh, it's, it's always an interesting push and pull with the data, as you kind of alluded to. Uh, we got the EIA reporting uh, crude supplies dropping less than expected. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, gas and inventories bit of a build there. Uh, Also, uh, Chinese data showing their imports of crudes dropping. You know, it's always been this talk about Chinese unquenchable demand for all of our raw materials and products. And if that's kind of if that's kind of slowing and ebbing a little bit, then maybe that's not so much in the bull camp for crude. So a lot of interesting things. And of course, as you mentioned, the the ongoing saga that is pretty much any day of the week, uh, something some tensions in the Middle East are going off. So that's kind of, there's always that premium, I think, kind of factored. And maybe a little bit higher now than there has been of late, but still, that's all these things kind of uh, pushing and pulling. We had Blue Putnam on from CME last week. He was talking about the issues with getting a lot of that shale oil out of some of these areas because they've kind of maxed their distribution and pipeline capacity. So they can pump all they want. They can't ship it all. So uh, there are some interesting issues that the market is kind of uh, impacting right now from from a structural standpoint and interesting one to watch, you know, uh, crude vol, all this, all the crude has been kind of very fascinating of late. And I think we'll obviously here on TWIFO, you can't do an episode without talking crude uh, because it's uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, Mike, I know you mentioned you make an interesting comment earlier on our, our network and it kind of caught my eye. I know you're a big metals head. And I know you love your your silver collars and everything else. You made an interesting comment, kind of caught my ear earlier on our network, where you said that silver comes like a thief in the night. Uh, what what exactly did you mean by that, sir? Well, in, in looking at it, uh, if you bring up a twenty year chart of silver, a silver chart even back to say uh, two thousand six. So let's look at. And I'm just randomly just taking a random sample here. here. If you go back to roughly 2006 and you look at silver, but you take away um, around 2010, uh, like maybe May of 2010 until, let's just say, July of 2013, you have a very flat chart in that uh, it is it really hasn't moved that much if you were to do that. However, uh, during that span and when we had the peaks of silver, in about April of 2011, it went up really fast. And that uh, my, my thief in the night comment is that uh, all of a sudden, uh, silver is putting you to sleep, and then uh, you wake up, and uh, it's uh, silver's all of a sudden tripled one day, it feels like. And so oftentimes, and I, I am a silver bull for the long haul, uh, and we talk about that a lot on the Option Block show, but with it, uh, our holdings are along the lines of that uh, we believe silver is going to go higher for the long haul, and we hedge it in various ways, with which um, uh, we can definitely talk about on this show as well. Uh, but it's not a tr- it, it's not a trending instrument. If you look at the S and P 500 over the last 20, 30 years, you'll notice an uptrend. Of course, you'll see the blips of the downtrend and the dot com bubble, uh, as well as 2008. But overall, it's it's more of a trending instrument. Whereas if you look at silver, it's more of a channeling instrument. And uh, I think if you are a long-term bull on silver, uh, which I am, uh, you need to have some type of a plan in place as to when to get out. Now, what we did, and uh, we talked about even on the shows back in the 2011 era, option block, uh, I was actually more into gold at that stage of, of of, of time. But similar concept, we did a lot of collars on it. And we still are doing various hedging techniques right now to this day. But I think that uh, you need to be able to 
uh, get it out at a certain time frame. So yes, I do believe it's a good buy and hold investment in general, but you need to be a little bit more active uh, if and when it comes like a thief in the night, like it did back in 2011. Always one for a colorful analogy, sir. I can always I can always rely on you for for that, if not else there, sir. I'm looking here at silver right now as we're talking. We don't get a chance to break down silver too often on the show. Uh, Nick's a gold bug. Uh, but you're more of a silver head. I like it, so it gives me a chance to mix it up a little bit. The werewolves don't like it when you come on because we talk a lot of silver. Silver obviously doing less paper options-wise, listeners, than gold is kind of just the way these things break down. By the way, if you guys are playing along, see me group.com slash twifo. Head on over to that drop down, the top left corner there. Uh, select the product category, select metals then of course go on over to silver you can see exactly what we're talking about here silver on the week kind of unched right now not a lot really going on as uncle mike was kind of uh, alluding to vol also kind of a mixed bag kind of up a little bit kind of down in some terms so kind of uh, all over the place out here uh, from a vol perspective open interest up pretty strong this week about 3.6 percent so a pretty decent week but interesting enough mr uh, uncle mike the the big trades of the week out here uh, are they're they're twofold really uh, because again silver doesn't do a ton of paper out here listeners but we got the SEP uh, what is that SEP sixteen calls so a little bit near all the money calls doing about twenty two hundred contracts uh, to- so far this week how's that breaking down pretty much the lion's share on Tuesday fourteen hundred the rest kind of piecemeal throughout the week but then right behind it Mike are the DS twenty nineteen thirty calls doing about almost twenty one hundred contracts so hot on its heels. The close number two contract, Dees, Dees 2019-30s. How do you feel about that, Mike? That's kind of uh, you like long-term silver. You got that long-term two-year collar. It's like someone maybe feeling a little bit of long-term silver love like you. Uh, what's not to love? <laughs> what's not to love? But, yeah, Dees 2020, I mean, that's definitely a long ways out there. That's actually further out than we're hedged at this point. But um, <clears throat> definitely I, I, I like longer-term options plays on silver longer term hedges on silver in general just because of the reverse skew that exists in the option world uh, a lot of opportunities is open up way. Uh, and if you believe silver is going to go up but if you're concerned with it going down like a thief in the night as well then there's a lot of opportunities and a, a lot of things that you, you can do in the collar world uh, that can help you with that as we're talking metals I know uh, Mick would be oh, Mick would be all upset if I didn't at least toss a little bit of love for the gold bugs out there. So let's see what's going on in gold lab gold continuing kind of to erode to the downside off about five handles this week or about a quarter of a percent, not a huge move right around 1215 right now. Gold vol though, maybe, maybe that puts a smile on your face, ticking up a little bit. Uh, it's, it's been in the toilet for so long. We've kind of stopped really commenting on it because it doesn't, it'll get a little bit of a blip like it is right now. And then next week it'll be coming back, crashing back down to earth. So it's kind of hard to get too excited by any blip in gold vol. But that said, there is a modest blip, going on right now if you are indeed so inclined to check those out open interest strong this week up about nearly five percent four point nine percent which is kind of interesting and the lion's share of the paper actually come in this week in actually dece dece 2018 with about 25 percent very scattered paper this week which is kind of interesting and the big trade of the week let's see out here and the shiny stuff are the 1275 calls in dece doing about nearly five thousand contracts 4700 or so pretty much all of that coming up yesterday Pretty much all that opening, 4,553 going up yesterday and pretty much all of that opening. So a lot of upside, 1,275s. Also, the 1,270s going up on Wednesday, too. Looks like maybe uh, there was a 1,270, 1,275 spread, but the numbers don't really line up. 3,500 of the 1,270s going up on Wednesday as well. So it could be a funky $5 wide (laughs) ratio vertical. That would be an interesting vertical. I'm not sure that $5, I'm not sure if that's... uh, if that's where you want to go, but hey, uh, it'd be an interesting. We've seen stranger trades certainly out here, particularly in metals. We've seen some very funky upside stuff in metals. Uh, Twelve ten puts also again out there in Dece, doing about thirty five hundred contracts. So Dece is kind of where all the action was. Also worth noting, the number four eleven eighty puts also in Dece about thirty four hundred, and then around our top five, actually front month here, SEP twelve hundred puts doing about 3,200 contracts. Uh, the lion's share actually coming on Monday for those. Actually, no, I'm sorry, Wednesday, 1,500. So half of that paper almost coming on Wednesday. Uh, so interesting interesting kind of diversity of paper out here in, uh, in gold this week. 1,200 puts in June, also very active. June 2019, got 2,500 of those on the tape. It's like a 12 half, 1,200 vertical went up on Wednesday, 2,000 by 25 times on the put side. Uh, so interesting ratio verticals going up everywhere 
interesting strike selection, a lot of interesting stuff going on. Metals, particularly gold, always an interesting place to watch things like skew changes, interesting funky verticals, and of course the ever-present gold bugs who just will not let go of, uh, of any of the upside out there in, uh, in metals land. Someone wrote into mentioning about platinum to us. And platinum's kind of taken on the chin. Some of the articles talking using uh, boxing analogies that if the other metals are down, platinum is, is on the canvas. It's out. So uh, not a good time for a lot of the precious metals out here these days, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. Let's move on really quickly. Uh, touch on the ags because you kind of have to. It's required by law these days. Uh, the beans have been kind of ground zero for the trade wars, and they uh, continue to be interesting. They also continue to be, it looks like they're kind of pretty much about unched from where they were this time last week on Showtime, right around 890. Uh, they were threatening to break through to that 900 level and beyond, at least this time right now. As of Showtime, uh, at least they could not sustain anything north of that. They're back around 890 again. So Beans Bulls, happy probably that they bounced off those extreme lows we saw during the trade war, but still uh, not uh, quite quiet. Ball also up across the board, except for some, some of the longer terms coming in a little bit ball-wise, but for the most part, ball. Uh, up and up pretty strong despite the fact that they're the beans are kind of net unched on the week open interest kind of slight this week so maybe the beans are quieting down a little bit two and a half percent up open interest here uh, this week and it turns out like we say right around the 890 handles where we said we're sitting coming into showtime here half of the paper this week uh, coming in that november contract 52.5 percent the 920 call so near term slightly all the money calls dominating the landscape here for soybeans so near-term bulls looks like they're uh, they're leading the party let's see how that broke down throughout the week here uh, the lion's share on wednesday almost all of that 6200 coming on wednesday a lot of that was closing actually about half of that paper was closing so looks like people people perhaps uh, giving up some of that near-term ghost maybe thinking they were hoping for a sustained rally north of 900 when we didn't see it coming in and closing out some of that paper. Also seen a lot of action on the par calls, the 1,000 calls. You remember, we had just broken through that to the downside back a few months ago when we had uh, the Acuna guys on. We were talking about a lot, like, did good deep dive into ags. People were wondering how deep that sell-off through the 1,000 level would go. Now we know, down uh, pretty far south of that. Uh, so about 7,000 of the par calls going up this week as well. Looks like maybe a bit of a vertical going up there as well because about 4,500 of them going on Wednesday as well. Wednesday was a big day out there for beans upside again a lot of those closing as well 1500 so Wednesday has a big day for closing upside north of the 900 strike in the beans calls it seems like uh, which is uh, intriguing in and of itself nine and a half calls also doing about six thousand contracts uh, pretty active out there as well some puts 860 800 840 kind of the rounding out our top at that point six <laughs> uh doing about five thousand to about 4200 respectively each let's look at some weird outliers if we can really 1180 calls Getting a little bit of love here in, what is that, in July of 2019, 1,200 contracts going up, 1,000 on Tuesday, 218 on Wednesday, it's all that opening. So there is some opening positioning to the upside, it's not all closing, uh, but still interesting stuff here in the beans. Really quickly, some of you hit us up with this, uh, this, this data coming out, I believe it was Bloomberg, talking about the ags. And just in general, they had a nice visual representation. I'll try to put some of this in the show notes of just how our agricultural land is actually used <laughs> in the U.S. Uh, overall, just net land mass wise, ag land, ag land devoted to agriculture uses takes up about a fifth, about 20 percent of uh, the land we we use and uh, we have in the country. Uh, the actual land used, though, to grow actual crops that we eat, that's much smaller. It's only about the size of they term here, Indiana, Illinois, and half of Iowa combined. So if you can kind of picture that weird melange of states, uh, then uh, that's, that's what it is. Uh, more than a third of our entire corn crop devoted to ethanol production. Uh, so that won't surprise any of you who follow these products. And the most of our crop land is actually used for livestock feed uh, or exports, or again, is also left. They have to let it rotate a bit. So that's left idle to let the land uh, kind of uh, recuperate here. So interesting factoids coming out of uh, Bloomberg here, uh, which is uh, interesting, interesting stuff uh, really quickly. Uh, this is just some import data here. Uh, let's keep on uh, rolling. Oh, by the way, one third of U.S. land is used for pasture, which is a fascinating thing. <laughs> uh, and 25 uh, percent. That is 
administered by the federal government. Who knew? Uh, we can get it we, knee deep into all sorts of fantastic ag visuals, but we got to keep on rolling uh, really quickly here before we get to some of your questions. Uh, let's break down our movers and shakers of the week. These are the hot, big moving products, the big movers and shakers over there that are listed on the CME group. Again, this is just pure underlying futures performance. There's no volatility. There's no options open. Nothing like that. Just straight up what's moving and shaking out there uh, this week. And the upside here, our top five oats, number one, with about 7.7% to the upside. So good week for oats. And number two, again, this is just for the week. Uh, number two, uh, the nat gas up nearly 5%, 4.83%. Number three, Iron ore up about 4.4%. Lean hogs, our old friend Lean hogs, up about 3.5%. Round out the top five. The euro dollars up about 1.63%. To the downside, we've got rough rice just getting wiped out here. Off looks like about 8% exactly. Number two, WTI. Again, not a great week for WTI. Off about 4 almost 5%. Uh, we've got uh, Arbob off about 3.25%. Number four, Lumber off about 3.15%. And rounding out our bottom five here are, is Palladium actually off 2.15%. Now, Mike, Ron, and Sean, I hope you guys put on some of your question-answering pants because it is time for our futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to the Futures Options Feedback. You guys know the drill. You ask questions, we answer them. We try to get to as many as we can here on the show. Uh, Ron and Sean, you guys are first up here. Looks like we got to back going back to the realm of equities uh, with this first question. This comes from uh, listener Dol Dolomite. Uh, they want to know, what is the best way <laughs> to harvest the higher levels of volatility in the Russell 2000? This is, you know... Probably a common question you guys probably get a lot over there because, you know, we've seen a lot of data. We've talked about it many times on this show. Structurally, Russell 2000 is a very, uh, a very volatile, much more volatile product structurally than the S&P and a lot of other indices because small caps by nature, more volatile. Uh, so that makes, uh, makes sense, of course. There's a lot of interesting ways... We could we could skin that guy. Probably easily spend the rest of the show talking about that. But before we even get into that, Ron and Sean, uh, this is is this a use case you're hearing a lot from uh, from your audience out there? People coming to the Russell and trying to use it to try to harvest some volatility at a time when maybe it's harder to find in other indices. It's uh, you know historically it's been a more volatile index, right and. That has been shown in the and reflected in the, the options markets with uh, the skewness of uh, uh, the downside. The, the puts have always uh, traded rich to other index options. Ways to harvest, you know, you know, like we can't give you any kind of trading guidance to, uh, to to the to the person that asked the question. Unfortunately, this is where I really miss Nick Howard to kind of uh, talk talk. Uh, Put spreads and uh, the other strategies that uh, he's so well versed in in these products. So, um, but we'll just leave it at that. We know there's there's tremendous opportunity of trading things like put spreads to harvest that 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 uh, skewness and taking advantage of that volatility in the in the uh, markets. But as as you know, the volatility has come in quite a bit due to the performance of the Russell 2000. Uh, you actually mentioned the spreads at like 290 between VIX and RVX right now. Um, and it's starting to widen, but that's because of the drop in volatility of the other products. So, um, which is uh, uh, which is healthy. But, and uh, uh, again, I can't I can't really give direct tra trading suggestions at this point. Sorry. 
No fun, sir. No, of course. We're <laughs> just pulling your leg here. But, you know, I'm looking here right now. Uh, I'll, I'll hop in the Nick seat because he's Mr. Mr. Quick Skew and everything. And that's, of course, this is, of course, data you could get uh, from looking at Quick Strike listeners. So head on over to cmegroup.com slash twifo or head on over to bandticks.com. Kick the tires on the, on the free trial there for yourself. One of the most common ways to harvest any sort of volatility premium in any equity or index is the simple put and put spread to the downside selling. Uh, we probably lean more towards put spreads here just because it's a more risk mitigated strategy. If you just naked blasting out puts, uh, it could sometimes come back to bite you. People usually do those, shall we say, in somewhat overabundance, <laughs> and then it leads, to, uh, it leads to bad things happening. So we like to counsel put spreads uh, whenever possible. That's kind of the most basic way, and you could do that, across the, of course, across the broad spectrum of Russell products out there. You could do, of course, the uh, Russell 2000 options over there at CME. There's a bunch of ways you could harvest that have listed options on Russell 2000. You could use those to harvest. It's probably the most basic, easiest, way, easiest thing for people to wrap their heads around. Uh, if you not don't have the underlying, of course, you could use that to use that as a way to leg into long underlying as well. Uh, so an interesting kind of combo there. We can get all sorts of others. There's all sorts of spreads we could do. You, people like to trade the spread of vol between the S&P E-mini and the E-mini Russell 2000 as well. So there's a lot of ways you can do that, you know, during straddles and all kinds of vol spreads. We don't really have a lot, enough time to go into all the myriad ways that you could harvest that. So we'll keep it simple here in terms of near term out of the money downside put harvesting is probably the most obvious way to go. Looking at the uh, quick skew here, it does seem like you're not getting quite as rewarded for that uh, in the R in the Russell 2000 skew as you were a few weeks ago. Uh, the puts were a little bit uh, a little bit richer uh, to the at the money about 20 percent uh, back oh a few weeks ago now or about a month of change ago now they're coming in a little bit now uh, so uh, that put vol not quite as rich at the money vol obviously down as well uh, so we're seeing not quite as rich there the calls are also. Uh, uh, looking a little ticking up a little bit there so maybe you can get a little bit of love if you want to do some overriding there but in general dive deep into that quick skew tool that's kind of the one you're going to want to use because especially in equities when you want to look at the skew before you're harvesting uncle mike you do uh you've been known to do a little bit of uh of premium harvesting uh and usually in the s p not so much in the russell but if you if you had to go about it in the russell would you have a preferred methodology sir yeah, I'm typically more of a fan of selling a vertical. Uh, what I like doing is you know, even in the, whether it's the Russell, the S&P or whatever, but um, <clears throat> the thing that I like about selling put spreads is that you know what your worst case scenario is going to be. Uh, if you are selling short puts uh, without another leg to hedge it, then one of two things needs to happen. Uh, one, you need to have 100% of the maintenance available in your account, assuming the Russell were to go to zero, uh, which there's something to be said for that in the equity world in terms of doing a wheel trade, uh, or you need to have the maintenance set up to where you know where you're going to get out of it should it go against you. So for example, if the maintenance requirement isn't very high, which a lot of times that's the case in the futures options world, you can sell puts and only have maybe in some cases five to 10% of the underlying uh, as your maintenance requirement when selling a put. And oftentimes what I've seen tr traders in the futures world through or futures options world through the years do is make the mistake of thinking, okay, I'm going to sell this far out of the money put and I'm going to get, okay, I only need to have maybe a 5% requirement on it. I can get this much. I can get a 20% rate of return so long as the, uh, the Russell doesn't go down 12% in a month, and I'm just making up numbers right now, so I don't know if that's actually the case right now with uh, current trades, but people think things like that, and it works great. It works great for months and months and months, and then people think about how smart they are, and they just get smarter and smarter the more money they make, and then all of a sudden, that one month where we have some type of a crazy event, uh, like we did in late January, early February this past year, then all of a sudden, not only are all their profits wiped out for the last 24 months, but then all, a lot of their initial capital is going to be gone as well. Uh, so I tend to prefer just doing a put spread. Uh, yes, you do have to pay money uh, to actually buy the hedge leg of the spread, but uh, it avoids a lot of unnecessary surprises that could easily be avoided. <clears throat> I'm with you there, sir. That's definitely... Uh... Definitely the way uh, I like to proceed and the way we typically counsel here 
on the old network. All right, let's see what else. Uh, we'll see what else we got in store for us here. Oh, Mike, since we're talking, uh, since we're talking skew and and things like that, and you're a Mr. Metals, it's a perfect one for you. This comes from Levy, Lee, Levy, perhaps. Uh, they're saying, is this a favorable environment for metals callers? They're looking mostly at gold and silver, not copper or industrial. So, Mike, that's a, when I think metals callers, you're, you're my go-to guy. How's, how are they shaping up out here these days? Uh, it's pretty interesting. So right now, uh, I was just looking at just to prepare for the show today. Uh, right now, just uh, in SLV alone, you could actually buy the underlying for roughly – $14.50 and do a conversion for 323 days. And you could actually get a conversion. What that means is that you're buying the at the money put, which would be $14.50, selling the at the money covered call for roughly a dollar sixteen dollar seventeen depending on what your fill is going to be. And I'm doing the math on this, and for 323 days, so long as and this doesn't factor in pin risk so you got to have have the ability to handle that should it be right at 1450 at expiration friday in january but right there it gives you a 2.8 percent rate of return uh so long as the underlying is still in existence in 323 days and i took the time to annualize that that gives you roughly a 3.15 percent realized rate of return uh, current CD rates right now are, uh, and this was the highest one that I could find. I was just looking before the show on bankrate.com. I found one for 2.5% for one year, and you have to hold it for 12 months. Now, he, that's kind of exciting to me, but this is what I thought was really exciting in the skew that exists in the metal world. <clears throat> you could actually go along the underlying and then buy a 15 half put, sell a 15 half covered call, and you can do that for pretty much even money. And this is her, and I just did a couple of random ones because I figured we'd be talking about this on the show today. Um, that gives you the ability to pretty much have no downside risk because you're buying the at-the-money put and having it financed by an out-of-the-money covered call. That gives you the ability to have potential upside of roughly $1 in silver. Now, with that, that means that over the course of 13, or I'm sorry, of rough 11 months, actually a little bit less than that, you have the ability to make 6.8% if silver were to go up $1 with virtually no risk, uh, no downside risk, I should say. Uh, there's always risk of your broker going belly up and that type of thing, uh, which is very minimal. But with no downside price risk, uh, you have that ability to get a potential of up to 6.8% uh, within a 323-day period. So to answer your question, I think it's a great time to be playing around with collars and the metals, and those are just those are just a few that I came up with by just doing some sh some research uh, to contribute to the show. Well done, sir. Well done indeed. Unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of yet another yet another. There we go. Come to the end of yet another episode of all things Twifo. Let's see if we can get... Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. All sorts of crazy stuff happening here, listeners. Uh, let's see if we can get back on really quick with our buddies over there, all the way out in Seattle. The connection to Seattle is kind of wonky. Sean and Ron, are you guys there with us? We are back. There you are. All right. I thought we had you there. So before the, uh, before the Skype gods stop smiling upon us again... If listeners are intrigued about what you guys are doing over there at Footsie Russell and the indexing, where should they go? What should they do? And also, you guys mentioned you're kind of uh, putting your heads together on some new interesting derivatives initiatives. Anything you could tease us with coming down the pike? <laughs> so that's a good question. Um, you know, we, we're, we're always looking at new ideas and new ways to bring tools to the market to help investors manage their exposures. So if you take a look at... Uh, the you know some of the really popular products out there today, like the Russell 2000, you know that's definitely you know exposure on, on small caps. So we're talking to you know our industry counterparts about other types of exposures that 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 might be you know suitable for a, for a futures or options 
uh, you know, type vehicle. Nothing specific that I can share today, but you know, as you you know, as you look across, you know, the smart beta, you know, schemes. Those are the types of strategies that that are getting a lot of attention today. There you go. If you want to learn more, some of that research I mentioned at the top of the show, breaking out the Fang stocks versus uh, the Russell indices and other things, check it out, footsierussell.com. And, of course, you can always give them a follow while you're there on Twitter, at footsie, F-T-S-E, Russell, over there on Twitter. And Uncle Mike, sir, you're always cranking away interesting new things. If our listeners are intrigued by these metal collars, you're always slinging over there at St. Charles Wealth Management. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? By all means, contact me. Check out my website at www.stcharleswealth.com uh, or give me a call, shoot me an email if you would like to work with an advisor who's not afraid of the word derivative. And uh, in about another month or so, we'll be announcing it on the option block uh, as well. But uh, we're going to do some in-person presentations again. Now with the summer season over, the kids back in school, uh, let's talk some options. Let's do it, or I should say you should do it. Head on over to St. Charles Wealth Management. Hit up Mike and see him. Maybe if you live in the Chicagoland area, you can even go up there and see him in person for some in-person meetings. Now, on behalf of Uncle Mike and Ron and Sean from Footsie Russell, and even our old buddy Nick out there having his fun uh, vacation from Quick Strike. Check him out, by the way, if you haven't done so already. What are you doing? You're listening to the show. We use all that data throughout the show. Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X.com. Click on that blue. Check out the Quick Strike trial right there. You see all this data we're talking about here and a whole ton more. So get on over there. If you're trading these products, I really literally don't know how you're doing it without that platform because it's kind of the only game in town when it comes to analytics. There's a reason why CME has integrated them into everything on their site because they make a lot of good stuff. So Bantix.com. Click on that Quick Strike link and you'll be good to go. And on behalf of Nick as well, Andy, myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing to the show and for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you back here next week for more of This Week in Futures Options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 